Each spacecraft carries a golden disk. It holds a snapshot of humanity, a dispatch to the stars. Hello from the children of planet Earth. And now the Voyager mission is about to cross the final frontier. They are the first objects built by humans ever to pass beyond the solar system and into the galaxy beyond. April 1979, and two years after launch, Mission Control was steering the Voyagers towards their first rendezvous. It was the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. Before Voyager, the best images astronomers had of Jupiter and its moons were fuzzy photographs. Could the Voyagers change all that? I think we all felt that we were in the tradition of Galileo, who was the first to see the moons of Jupiter, uh, and the first to, to apply an instrument to increase our ability to observe the universe. Voyager was just the latest tool which we as a civilization had managed to devise. And of course, the tool was so powerful that we saw things nobody had seen before and that nobody had imagined we would see. See, I, I'm, I'm a weatherman, I'm an atmospheric scientist, and uh, we knew about 300-year-old storms, the Great Red Spot, because people had been looking at it from Earth. And, and for me, the, the surprise was, when we got up close, we saw that the atmosphere was just churning and turbulent, and it, and it made uh, uh, this 300-year-old storm all the more mysterious, because how could it go on uh, in the midst of all this turbulence? In addition to extreme weather, Jupiter has an immense magnetic field, 10,000 times stronger than Earth's. And for the Voyagers, that was a problem because this magnetism creates lethal radiation belts, which can scramble the computers of any spacecraft that gets too close. Yet getting close was exactly what was needed. The Voyager team wanted to send Voyager 1 to explore Io, one of Jupiter's four largest moons, and it was the nearest of all of them to the planet. The spacecraft was designed to withstand a certain total dose of radiation, and fully 50% of that expected dose was going to occur as we approached and flew by Io. As Voyager 1 approached, it sent back recordings of the radio signal generated by the radiation. These are the real sounds of the onslaught. Back at JPL, the Voyager team worried whether it could withstand such an assault and if the gamble would pay off. Voyager navigation engineer Linda Heider was the first to find out. I came in about 9 o'clock that morning to the navigation area, and the tape with the pictures the spacecraft had taken the day before was on my desk. I put them on the computer system, and I displayed them. And I could see that Io, the moon of Io, was a crescent, as very often our own moon is a crescent in the night sky. And I went and enhanced the brightness, and there appeared beside Io an object, a huge object, and it completely captured my attention. It looked like another moon peeking out behind Io. But there was no other moon, and there was nothing wrong with the camera. Linda decided this object had to be part of Io. And in fact, that was very hard to accept because the size of this object was enormous. And when I explored it, I was able to find that this large, strange object 
It was exactly coincident and fell over a heart-shaped feature on Io. What I had discovered was the huge plume of a volcanic eruption arising 270 kilometers over the surface of Io and raining back down onto it. So I had discovered the first ever volcanic eruption ever seen on another world besides the Earth. The gamble of being exposed to such radiation had paid off. Voyager 1 had revealed that Io, the closest of Jupiter's large moons, was more geologically active than the Earth. Jupiter's enormous gravity stretches and squeezes the moon, forcing its core to heat up and its interior to stay molten. With Jupiter behind them, the two Voyager spacecraft headed further out into interplanetary space. It would be more than two years before they reached the next destination on their grand tour, the planet Saturn, almost a billion miles away. Jupiter behaves more like a star than an ordinary planet like Earth. It's made from the same stuff as the Sun, and supercharged auroras suggest that extremely powerful radiation surrounds Jupiter. This makes getting near to the planet very difficult. Trying to get anywhere close to Jupiter is really, really hard because of the intense radiation of the magnetic field. So when you send a spacecraft, you understand it's not going to live for very long. We've not been to Jupiter that many times, which is one reason NASA's Juno mission is so exciting. Juno has been sent right into the heart of Jupiter's auroras to discover the secrets behind the radiation that causes them. Launched in 2011 and costing more than a billion dollars, Juno travels at more than 124,000 miles per hour, covering over one and a half billion miles on its five-year journey to Jupiter. This is NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. It's the nerve center for the Juno mission. So we've just been through our first science pass with all the instruments on. Everybody's doing great, everybody's healthy, the data's looking amazing, all the scientists are incredibly excited. Heidi Becker is studying the radiation environment around Jupiter using Juno. When Juno went through the really nasty radiation environment for the first time, it's kind of um, edge of your seat type moment. Heidi measures the strength of radiation around Jupiter by looking at photographs of stars taken by the Juno spacecraft. This is a regular radiation free image collected by Juno's star tracker. The stars appear like uh, points of light like you're used to when you look up at the stars at night. The stars are constant points of light in the photograph. But when radiation particles hit the camera, they appear suddenly as additional white spots and streaks of light. Each of these frames is another level of radiation. And all of these squiggles and holes that are being added to the star field, that's the radiation signature. These are the radiation particles that create Jupiter's auroras. The particles are kind of like machine gun fire creating bullet holes in an image. And so we can count those individual bullet holes. And that's what helps me understand the radiation environment. So uh, one person's noise is another person's music or data. This data from Juno allows scientists to map the planet's radiation. The radiation fields of Jupiter are so intense, we know they are going to eventually fry our spacecraft. Juno has on the order of about a two-year lifetime. We understand that. This intense radiation lights up Jupiter's auroras. But where does it come from? What's feeding Jupiter's magnetic field with radiation? Scientists looking for evidence have spotted clues in a mysterious bright spot, tracing a path across the lights. 
They now think that Io, one of the 67 moons that orbit Jupiter, holds the key to the planet's auroras. There's this very intense magnetic interaction between Jupiter and its moons. And you can actually see this in the aurora. And you see a glowing spot moving around in the auroras. And one of the most dramatic ones, the most dramatic footprints to see is that of Io. Io orbits at 217,000 miles from Jupiter, held in place by the planet's massive gravity. It's nothing like the moon that orbits Earth. When we sent our first spacecraft, we saw amazingly volcanoes going off. Could these remote volcanoes be the source of Jupiter's supercharged auroras? In the mission to get closer to Saturn than ever before, the getting the Cassini spacecraft to its new home was a challenge for the team of fearless rocket scientists. So we'll go into the uh, dark room. Inside the dark room, the mission support area is where the whole flight team gathers for critical events, like the final plunge, launch, or orbit insertion. It took seven years to get to Saturn, a spiraling journey that involved four gravity assists, close flybys past planets that boost the speed like a slingshot. It's a flight path designed by head of navigation, Dwayne Roth. We had a Titan 4B. Titan launch. 4B. So that, that was the, to get us away from the, the Earth, but then it still wasn't quite enough to make it all the way to Saturn, so we had two Venus flybys, gravity assist from each of those, an Earth gravity assist, and finally we got a Jupiter gravity assist, and that got us to Saturn. Once Cassini was approaching Saturn, it had to perform possibly its most critical maneuver of the mission, a perfectly timed engine burn that would slow it down enough to be captured in orbit by the giant planet. Saturn orbit insertion was obviously incredibly nerve-wracking. We spent seven years guiding the spacecraft to get to Saturn to get it into orbit. If it hadn't done the orbit insertion, which was a 90-minute burn on the main engine, if we hadn't done that, we'd have been a Saturn flyby <laughs> and just gone on out in space. The Doppler has flattened out. <laughs> During its 13-year stay, Cassini has revealed Saturn as a unique jewel in the solar system, a gas giant with swirling storms, a dancing sprinkling of moons, and surrounded by bright but paper-thin rings of ice. The origin of the rings is still a mystery, as is the complex gravitational interplay between rings, moons, and planet. So this is one of those discoveries we made that really threw us for a loop. This is the outer edge of the B-ring, and these, as you can see, are spiky shadows that are created by these features here that are sticking up two and a half miles. Two and a half miles above a sheet of debris that's only 30 feet thick. Wow. It was just extraordinary. It was out of science fiction. That's what this whole mission has been. But hidden in the images from Cassini are clues to the formation of this complex and dynamic system. Well, we know the rings of Saturn are, are made of ice. And this is really solid block of ice here, but this is not the sort of ice the rings are made of. Carl Murray is part of the imaging team, trying to work out how rings make moons and moons make rings. He sort of thinks it's more like sort of fluffy ice. So it's really the difference between a, a snowball and a, and a hailstone. So this would be like a hailstone, but if you kind of break it up, you start to get more of a flavor for what the, the ring particles might actually be made of. And the fluffy nature of the ice kickstarts the process of clumping. So if the ice is fluffy, the particles perhaps are more likely to, to coalesce rather than to, to, to break up or bounce off each other because there's more surface area for the, for the particles to stick. Eventually, 
gravity can take over, and a moon can be born. And it's the moons of Saturn, rather than the planet itself, that have offered up many of the most incredible surprises and mysteries to be solved. They're incredibly diverse, ranging in size from a few hundred feet to bigger than the planet Mercury. But out of all these moons, the two standouts are Titan and then Enceladus. Before Cassini's intrepid voyage, our best view of Titan was as an orange foggy blob. Titan was so mysterious to us before we got there. At first sight, it may not look like much, but peer through the fog and an astonishing world is revealed. A world that surprised everyone.